Sorry. I'm not sure I'll get through this in 30 minutes, so I can start now. Uh, but I'll do a brief intro. Uh, my name is Phil Bedard. Uh, I'm from Cisco, obviously. Um, I work as a TME in Cisco, mostly focused on, on network architecture. Uh, I've been at Cisco for about two and a half years, but I spent uh, around, I'll say, 20 years working for service providers. So after two years, I still have some brain cells left, but uh, next year they'll probably be gone. Um, but the talk today is really, uh, you know, the intersection of optical transport uh, and routing and next generation networks. Um, I use the word intersection because people have talked a lot in the past about convergence between IP and optical transport. Uh, it really hasn't paid off that, that much in the, in the past, but really this is kind of a new way of looking at how we converge those two networks in the future, kind of enabled by innovation that's coming, you know, both on the optics side uh, as well as some things on the router side that, that's being done to really enable a, a next generation architecture that's truly uh, converged. Um, kind of a quick agenda. I will kind of take a brief look at what current multi-layer network architectures look like and that really when I say multi-layer, I mean an IP routed layer and then an underlying transport, optical transport layer uh, and what that looks like, you know, what that design looks like, what are some of the current issues with those types of deployments. Uh, and then we'll take a brief look at the, the next generation architecture, you know, what the components are of that, what really are kind of the building blocks that are enabling this in the future. Uh, and then, you know, time permitting, we'll look at a, a modeling example of a, a real network to see how these, this new design stacks up to what we would say is an existing or current uh, multi-layer design. Uh, but I'll take a step back, you know, in the beginning and kind of talk a bit about, you know, how topologies have evolved for IP networks over the years. Um, the first IP networks when they were deployed, you know, really just hop by hop IP networks. Um, and when I say hop by hop, it really means at a packet, at a packet layer. Um, and that would have maybe originally been deployed years ago using an ATM network, you know, and we connected routers via ATM networks, but an ATM network is still a, a packet network. Um, and over time, things evolved uh, to have a network where we needed to, you know, potentially move away from having traffic pass through every router in a ring. Uh, the main thing that drove that was traffic demand and cost. You know, uh, router interfaces have been pretty expensive for a long time. Um, so we found new ways or novel ways to bypass router interfaces based on A to Z traffic demands. Um, really, you know, the, the traffic demand, uh, you know, drives what the topology of the network looks like, or at least the logical topology. Um, so that really drove the need to have like an underlying system, you know, that can make better use of things like the fiber optic, uh, uh, you know, transport between locations. Uh, because like I said, the routers didn't really keep up with capacity, uh, and they're also very expensive to deploy uh, in that sort of hop by hop uh, ring manner. Um, and it really kind of led to, you know, multi-layer networks where I do have a separate optical transport layer uh, and then I have an IP routed layer or packet layer on top of that. Uh, and those are typically deployed today in, you know, two different ways. The, the one on the left there I call the router plus muxponder model. You could call that IP plus DWDM. Uh, but that really kind of fits the way many networks are deployed today with a, a routed layer and then a completely separate photonic layer underneath that. Uh, where I'm using active elements in that network. So that's, that's with MUX bonders, it's with active rotums doing uh, add drop. And there may be maybe other components in there such as amplifiers that are used for longer distances. Um, another method of deploying this is, you know, what we call IP over WDM. You know, the difference between these two is with that, you know, router plus MUX bonder model, uh, the wavelength on that network is being launched by the optical transport system. And the DW, IP over WDM model, it's being done on the router itself. Um, and we still see a lot of deployments of that, uh, mainly in lower speed networks, uh, access networks, aggregation, uh, like think, you know, utilizing things like CWDM and DW, DWDM with uh, you know, 10 gig optics. And now we're seeing more of it 100 gig, 200 gig you know, kind of CFP DCO, but still mainly in, I'll say, lower speed aggregation networks and not really high bandwidth, uh, metro, regional, and uh, long haul backbone networks. Uh, we also see a lot of this in DCI where there's uh, shorter reaches involved, you know, between uh, those different router elements. So we've seen things like 100 gig, you know, PAM4 optics become, you know, popular you know, for DCI. Uh, 
uh, recently, but not really used in metro, regional, or long-haul networks. Um, here's a bit of kind of a, a linear view of what these different connectivity types look like. Uh, and I'm not going to read through all the bullet points, but you know, it's really, you have connections over dark fiber, uh, you know, and obviously that's just connecting two routers back to back over standard optics, or they may be uh, long reach optics of some sort if you have a longer distance involved. Uh, but it doesn't make the best utilization over a piece of fiber, or it doesn't make the best uh, resource utilization of fiber, which is a fairly expensive resource. Um, you're really limited to just the speed you have in those, those two optics that interconnect those routers. Um, the second type is the one that I just spent a bit of time talking about, and the way that most, I'll say, higher bandwidth networks are deployed today, when you look at regional and long-haul networks, uh, to really maximize you know, what you get out of a piece of fiber. Um, and that does have multiple active elements, where I do have a transponder, I have a rotom that's grooming that traffic onto the fiber. Um, and you can see kind of in the, the you know, transceiver view there, uh, the number of optics I need to complete that connection end to end. You know, I have a typically a gray optic connection or back to back gray optic connection between a router and a transponder or a muxponder. Uh, and typically, you know, you either have a some sort of, uh, you know, these days it might be a CFP2 DCO or ACO optic out of a, a transponder shelf, um, or it may be an integrated, uh, you know, kind of photonic interface that's actually putting that wavelength out to go onto the piece of fiber. Uh, but there's a lot of components that are involved in that, that type of network. It uses more power. Um, and obviously, you know, from a space power efficiency perspective, you know, it's, it's a lot more than what you're doing over dark fiber, but you do unlock the full capacity of that uh, uh, piece of fiber. Um, IP over WDM, again, you know, there's no transponders involved in this. Uh, the wavelengths are launched off of the router itself. Uh, and in this use case, I just have kind of a simple MUX that's you know, connecting those two elements. It still allows me to get better utilization out of the fiber uh, between those two endpoints, uh, but without all the active elements that are involved. Uh, but in this case, you know, I can't bypass one router through a rotom. Um, every hop is you know, point to point between the two routers. Um, so what are some of the issues with these current kind of IP plus optical and IP plus DDM, DWDM deployments? Um, and this is, these aren't new bullet points. Uh, if you've looked at anything around you know, packet optical convergence in the last you know, 10 or so years, uh, these kind of always come up. Um, the big one is that I'm operating you know, multiple kind of opaque networks. You know, if I'm using back-to-back -back gray optics between a transponder and a router, uh, there's really no information sharing. Uh, there are completely different control planes between those two networks. Uh, typically on the transport side, the control planes are you know, wholly proprietary. Um, you know, we, we had these, this notion of using GMPLS, and GMPLS has been worked on for many, many years. Uh, it never really kind of satisfied its original goals of creating this kind of multi-layer control plane uh, that we could use between those two layers. So today there isn't much work done between the router layer and the, the transport layer in trying to make those elements talk to each other. Um, something that's probably a bit newer is this notion of different protection schemes. Uh, some, you know, optical restoration, which is restoring a circuit on the optical network, you know, so it does not go down on the uh, routed network, you know, it's become a little bit more popular, but when you restore paths on an alternative, you know, fiber path, uh, the routed network really has no idea you know, what that path is. You know, if you're doing you know, constraint-based routing where you're dependent on you know, shared risk link groups or path disjointness for services, um, it's very hard to share information between those two different layers. You know, so you end up with mismatch protection and potentially uh, in certain failure cases, you know, your service is gonna go down when you don't expect it. Um, and then just organizational silos uh, and time and speed to actually turn up services or turn up circuits. Uh, in many organizations, there's a separate IP group uh, from a transport group. Uh, there's a few where those are combined groups, but very often they're different operations teams, they're different engineering teams, they're different architecture teams. Uh, so it takes a lot of work in order to plan those networks, to engineer them, and then ultimately operate them and you're typically duplicating some of the same tasks over and over when it comes to those, those planning functions. So this is kind of the, the fancy 3D model of you know, what a lot of these, uh, I'll say higher bandwidth IP networks look like today, and it's uh, really two layers. You do have that routed layer that's connected via gray optics to this rotom layer, and the rotom layer really is what gives you 
any, any, any to any connectivity between the routers on that network. Uh, I make the point of this, this network does not have you know, OTN services on it. Um, if you're using OTN, you know, just add another layer to the network that's sandwiched in between the routed layer and the uh, underlying you know, optical transport layer. Um, so that's, you know, like I said, if you had that OTN layer, it just adds more complexity to the network. Uh, at least that's, that's my worldview on, on OTN. Uh, but, you know, so how does this evolve? Like, how does this change? And how do we uh, kind of, how would we look at building networks in the future? Um, sort of the, the second one, and this is kind of where we're focused in the future on, you know, how we build uh, really kind of high bandwidth ne networks in the future. And you see that this is, no longer has that Rotom layer underneath. Uh, it is just a bunch of interconnected routers with those wavelengths being launched off of the routers. Uh, people don't like me to call this IP over DWDM at Cisco, but really that's, that's what it is. So it's a reimagining of that. Uh, but you know, with innovations, it doesn't have the, the drawbacks of the previous iterations of this. And I'll explain a bit more of that on the, uh, in, the follow, in the following slides. Uh, but when most people look at this, it looks like a lot of Cisco routers and we're just trying to sell you more router ports, um, which is true. Uh, but we're also an optical transport vendor. So we're talking about eliminating those layers for, for good reasons, let's put it that way. Oh, I think some of my icons left uh, the slide here. Uh, but so when we look at that, uh, and I'll go back. So, you know, I really call this a single layer hop by hop fabric. Um, so you'll see people at Cisco use the term hop by hop. This is kind of really what we mean is this single packet layer, unified packet layer without the Rotom network. Um, and this is really talking about like what's left of that optical transport network when I move to this type of architecture. Uh, you still have you know, C-band and L-band multiplexers. We want to make the most efficient use of the fiber that we have. So we still need multiplexers to put those signals on the fiber. Uh, you're still gonna have amplifiers. Um, you may have local amplifiers where you need them. Uh, you have ILAs. If your distances are greater than you know, say 80 kilometers, you still need amplifiers in this solution. You know, that's not magic. We haven't solved those issues. Um, so you still have some portions of the photonic network. What you don't have is you don't have muxponders, you don't have transponders. That function has been built into the, the, uh, the router optic. Uh, what you also don't have is a rotom network. So there's no any to any, you know, multi-degree rotom network that you're using anymore. Uh, the switching all goes through the IP and packet devices. Um, you also don't have to worry about regen. Um, and some people may say, well, a router is a really fancy regen, and that's absolutely true. You know, so, you, but you no longer have to worry about that at the photonic layer of the network. You know, it, since I am hop by hop between routers, I no longer have to worry about that. And like I said, the last uh, kind of four bullet points should be things that aren't uh, in the network anymore. Um, and I get this question. So I mentioned convergence, and convergence being something that people have talked about many times uh, over the past you know, 10 to 15 years and how that we can you know, either merge these networks, either at layer three through things like IP over DWDM. Um, you know, Cisco did this with the, the CRS many years ago, and there were large networks that were built using these 40 gig line cards. Uh, the reason this really didn't, you know, Main, it didn't, uh, I'll say, continue to be mainstream in a lot of networks is really kind of the bottom bullet point is, is density. There's always a density penalty with using these types of interfaces and routers. Um, and it's, that's always been the case. Uh, and, and that's really the, the main problem in the future that we're innovating to solve is that to, to not really have a density penalty when you look at these types of optics and routers. Um, the other thing is cost. You know, router cost is pretty expensive. IP interfaces in the past were, were pretty expensive. You know, so bypassing those routers on the photonic layer was, was a more inexpensive proposition. It, it followed the traffic demands that, uh, that I needed. So like I said, everything you know, generally comes down to density uh, and cost. And I mentioned a little bit earlier around router capacity. With a lot of the really high bandwidth networks we have today, I maybe couldn't, I couldn't simply build a hop by hop ring based network because routers didn't have the capacity end to end to fulfill those bandwidth needs. And I think with the, the advancements in the future of things like 400 gig that I'll talk about, we finally kind of unlock the capacity we need to make this more applicable on a wide scale outside of you know, specific kind of niche uh, applications. You know, so what are some of the, the short benefits that you get out of going to that, 
you know, single layer hop by hop architecture. Um, you know, things protection is is all done at the IP layer. Um, that's kind of an easy easy given one. In many networks today, they do all of their protection and restoration at the IP layer, anyways. Uh, I would say the majority of networks do, but if you are using something like optical protection and restoration, this simplifies that uh, quite a bit. Um, IP network utilization, and that's really the kind of the Statmux equation. Uh, if I'm using bypass with uh, high capacity circuits like 100 gig and 400 gig, uh, I'm really building a lot of capacity that I'm that I'm not potentially utilizing. Uh, if I get if I build things in more a hop by hop manner, then I can get the gains of Statmuxing at every hop across that network. Uh, wavelength efficiency, and I've got a sli next slide about that that I'll explain a little bit, you know, how that works. Um, obviously, simplifying network operations. If you're eliminating layers of the network, uh, that network you know, should be easier to operate. Uh, it's easier for me to stand up here and say that. And we have to find ways to make networks easier to operate, and that's you know, things that we're continuing to, to work on. And hand in hand with that goes into faster turn up. Um, if I don't have to you know, talk to the transport guy or open a transport ticket to get a new circuit between two routers, obviously that makes things much faster. Um, what it doesn't solve, um, and this is you know, my thing, you, you can't completely get rid of the, the optical transport guys, you still need to do uh, wavelength planning. Um, there may be less of it, but you still need to figure out which wavelengths go between each router. You still need to you know, figure out how that works. You still have to manage uh, you know, uh, multiplexing equipment, uh, amplifiers. So you, know, you still need people with the, the knowledge of that photonic network that know how to, to manage that. Uh, and the last bullet point is really around, you know, there's a lot of services that, that ride over some current networks other than just, you know, IP circuits between routers. Uh, they may be wavelength services for customers. You might have legacy TDM cir circuits on there or OTN-based services that are, that are non-IP. Uh, so we have to look in the future at how we solve, solve those problems. I'll say in this talk, it's a bit more about the high-speed IP networks that may not have those services. Um, but we're definitely looking to find out how we solve uh, those other types of, of services through, through emulation, just like we did with uh, low-speed TDM services. So this notion of wavelength utilization and how it's improved when I you know, basically have a router at each hop. And this is sort of a pre-canned example of that, you know, where I do have a ring of nodes, uh, and these would be routers uh, on this ring, uh, where they're you know, equally spaced, you know, 400 kilometers apart. Like I said, it's a bit of a canned example that probably would not happen so much in the real world. But between my A to Z locations, you know, those are uh, 1,600 kilometers apart. Uh, and really this gets, you know, into the, um, when, you, when you have higher speed bit rates uh, on the optical side, uh, there's always a trade-off with distance. Um, so if I want to carry a wavelength, a 100 gig wavelength, the longer distance, um, or if I want to you know, use bit rates that are higher, like 200 gig, 400 gig, 800 gig, or you know, even one terabit today, uh, the distance I can carry that signal you know, continues to de decrease. Uh, and this kind of gets to the point that every router hop is really like an, it's an OEO conversion. It's a regen. Uh, so I don't really run into the, the penalties of carrying a signal a long distance. Um, so I have that 400 gig signal that's really regenerated at each hop. Uh, if I'm using a direct 200 gig wavelength between those A to Z points, uh, I can't really use a 400 gig wavelength. I have to use a 200 gig wavelength. So now at each hop, I'm sort of I'm limited on that piece of fiber to a 200 gig wavelength, uh, which doesn't make the most uh, maximum utilization out of that single piece of fiber. Um, so really, that's kind of how we unlock you know better wavelength utilization in this hop by hop manner. And you may say, you know, if I've got to send that signal through every router, that's a really expensive thing to do versus sending it through the Rotom network. Uh, but those are the things that we're, we're trying to solve in the future to make that, that not the case, uh, to make sending that traffic through the routers, um, you know, near the cost or less costly than sending it through a, a Rotom ne network. So here's a few of kind of the innovations that are coming down the pipeline that really enable this type of architecture. Um, you know, 100 gig, uh, 200 gig CAP2 DCO has been very popular in access and aggregation networks that are a bit lower speed. And you'll see almost every vendor today has a device that's some number of 10 gig ports with a few CFP2 DCO ports. 
because like I said, for access and aggregation, it's become, you know, if you want to build a 200 gig access ring, uh, it's a very viable technology. Uh, I'll say for long-term growth and for higher speed networks, it's not really a solution. What's really the solution in, in the future is looking at uh, 400 gig interfaces, and specifically 400 gig ZR, uh, and something called 400 gig, uh, you know, what we call Open ZR Plus. Uh, and I've got a few slides where I'll talk about that specifically. Um, the other thing is our router MPU bandwidth capacity and kind of the continuing growth and what we can carry on a single device. Um, and IP router interface costs, other folks at Cisco may not like me to say this, but IP interface costs are gonna continue to drop. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about this complexity in optics and minimizing transceiver counts. It's a bit of a complex sentence, but I'll explain a bit what that means in a, a later slide. Excuse me. We look at like coherent optics. So 400 gig and 400 gig ZR, those are coherent optics. Uh, and I'm, there's other talks and where you guys can, can learn about what coherent optics are. Uh, but re what's really unlocking the, the density that we can you know, supply in the future using this solution uh, is the advancements that have allowed us to package all of that technology into a QSF P56 DD form factor. Uh, and that's in a relatively short amount of time. The first couple of you know, optics that you see there, that's really kind of an integrated on a line card optic. You know? And then we quickly moved to CFP2 ACO, where the DSP was still on a line card. Uh, and now you know, it's very ubiquitous now to find a CFP2 DCO, where we put the, the coherent DSP on the optic itself. And very quickly, we're moving to being able to do that at 400 gig in a QSF PDD optic. Uh, and looking at 400 gigs, this is kind of the alphabet soup of 400 gig standards. The ones that are important here are really um, ZR and ZR plus. Uh, 400 gig ZR is an OIF, which is the optical interworking form. Um, it was really an initiative to have a interoperable, coherent uh, DWDM, DWDM based uh, 400 gig optic from, from day one. And this is single channel uh, 400 gig. Uh, open ZR plus, you know, open 400 gig ZR plus. Uh, and really the real difference between these two is uh, the standard for ZR was really to have a 15 watt power dissipation. Um, but people saw like other applications to, for these coherent DWDM optics at 400, 400 gig and routers in the future, but they required a dissipation greater than 15 watts. So ZR plus really, it relaxes some of those requirements. It allows us to do more with the, the optic uh, than ZR does. Uh, I won't go over this too much, but ZR plus, uh, it does allow you to have different modulation schemes uh, depending on the distance and reach that you need with that optic. Uh, but the key thing is this is, this is a tunable DWDM optic. Um, and the form factor that we're looking at, you know, there will be varieties of this that are CFP2 DCO based, uh, but really the key one for doing this uh, single layer hop by hop architecture is the QSFP 56DD because now I can take a, a line card that's you know, built for 24, 36, 400 gig interfaces and not just use gray interfaces in that, I can use each one of those interfaces as a, a coherent DWDM interface. Uh, this is an interesting graph that I, I stole from a, a colleague of mine that, that shows uh, the growth of traffic delivered on the internet over time in gigabits versus the speed of it, the capacity of an NPU. Uh, and as you can see, the, the router MPU capacity has lagged behind the growth of traffic on the internet for, for many, many years. Um, and people have seen that if you buy routers. Uh, line cards have either lots of MPUs or you need lots of devices. Uh, but now we're finally getting to a point where we have very specialized MPUs, especially in cases where I'm handling a lot of aggregation and transit traffic and not a lot of you know, queuing, not a lot of you know, high touch services we're building very high capacity MPUs that are you know, soon gonna eclipse you know, 10 terabits per second in a single MPU. Like I said, those are highly specialized MPUs for you know, mostly transit traffic, but it's one of the things that really allows us to kind of unlock this architecture because it drives down the overall cost uh, of the device because I don't have multiple MPUs to cool, to power, and it just overall lowers uh, what that individual interface cost is. Uh, this kind of, this graph gets to sort of what I was talking about with the minimization of transceivers. Uh, and what it's comparing is the total cost of, of an interface broken down by what the router host interface cost versus what that optic cost, that pluggable optic costs. 
Um, and with 10 gig, most of that cost was still you know, kind of buried into the router itself. With 100 gig, as the complexity in the optic really you know, gets you know, more complicated, uh, obviously with 100 gig, we're talking about you know, four wavelengths with most uh, optics that go in routers. That optic is more complex, so it raises the price of that uh, versus the cost of that host interface on the router. With 400 gig, uh, the router, the optic is you know, relatively even more complex. Uh, and just due to like what I showed previously with the MPU bandwidth, you know, that's going to continue to drive down the cost of you know, gigabit per you know, or dollar per gigabit or whatever you know, metric you want to use of what that router interface costs per, versus what that, uh, that optic cost. So in a case where you are using a MUX bonder or a transponder, you really want to minimize the number of optics you're using. So if you're using a, a MUX bonder that has back-to-back -back gray interfaces, I have a lot of cost now in those optics that have to go into each side of that connection. Uh, so I really want to minimize the number of those optics that I'm, that I'm purchasing. What this graph doesn't show uh, very well is the kind of price compression of everything overall. Um, so if you really had a, you know, a fair comparison of absolute cost between these pills, you would see them go down a lot. Uh, and when you look at the comparative price or the projected comparative price of 400 gig at a bits per second level uh, versus 10, uh, it's a fraction of that. And like I said, that really kind of unlocks the, the cost element of this uh, versus the way we used to do things, versus, you know, building these networks in the past were very cost prohibitive, and that's what led to these multi-layer architectures. But now passing that traffic through a router is, is not as expensive as, as you might think it is. And I'll try to quickly go through uh, kind of a modeling example that we've done. And, uh, and with this type of architecture, we've done modeling to date, I think, for over 20 networks, uh, both uh, already deployed networks. Uh, like I said, this is sort of a CAN sample network. And the span of this network is around 100 kilometers, which is maybe a typical in the US uh, regional or metro network. Uh, and this is a, what we would call more of a subscriber heavy network. Um, so there's really four traffic sources, and then every other side of the network is like a traffic sink, a lot of north-south traffic. So like I said, typical kind of service provider network these days. Um, and then we, we do a, a traffic model. Uh, and really the traffic model is just north-south traffic. It's traffic from these caching sites and gateway sites down to subscriber sites. Uh, so there's really no traffic that goes in between the, the, uh, the edge sites on this network. And like I said, this is typical of what we see in a lot of either residential or mobile, mobile subscriber networks these days. And so we look at this, you know, hop by hop approach. And we are building, you know, basically packet rings at, uh, in this approach. And you can see this is a, a very high capacity network. So, you know, and this is all built with 400 gig interfaces. Um, so in this use case, we use over 1300, uh, you know, 400 gig interfaces to do this. Some of the lag sizes are very large. Uh, but this uses, you know, uh, no photonic elements other than uh, multiplexers and, and amplifiers. Uh, so there's no responders, no transponders, there's no rotoms in this network at all. Uh, we look at the hollow core approach, which is kind of a worst case scenario for optical things like wavelength utilization. This is building a, still having that full photonic optical transport network and building, you know, circuits from each source site to each edge site. And I would say, you know, very few networks are, are built this way today. Uh, but the, like I said, this hollow core approach, we just do it for comparison reasons between these different, uh, uh, different potential options. And then we look at optimized bypass, and that's really the way a lot of networks are deployed today. Uh, they have a full Rotom network underneath. Uh, they look at, you know, they do, there's modeling that's done to figure out, you know, how to interconnect things logically via optical circuits that you know, really lead to the lowest cost uh, you know, of carrying that traffic from the source to the destination. And like I said, you know, to date, this has really been the cost efficient way to deploy networks and really why these uh, multi-layer networks de were deployed to begin with. Uh, and it uses less interfaces than the, uh, the other options, but you still have that rotom layer underneath. Um, here's a way we kind of you know, compare these different options. And this is a load of 50 terabits per second which is a pretty high capacity network. There's very few networks today that have 50 terabits per second of, uh, of bandwidth. Uh, and obviously, you know, the number of router interfaces used is much higher on the, on the, uh, 
the hop by hop network, and that's to be expected because now I'm passing all these tra all this traffic through each router uh, versus the bypass. Uh, the big thing to keep in mind, though, is this: there is no Rotom network, so there's no Rotom network to manage. Uh, there's no transponders uh, or muxponders. Uh, it doesn't mean that you couldn't use you could use the bypass network without muxponders and transponders and just simply Rotoms. Um, but that Rotom cost is still there. You still have to manage that layer of the network. Uh, and this does not have sort of the absolute cost comparison. Um, we can absolutely do that for certain networks because we don't really want to talk about absolute cost. But you'll find that the absolute cost of carrying this in the future, even with 1,300 router interfaces, is very comparable to the solution that's uh, bypass-based and definitely less costly than the uh, hollow core model. Uh, this is a bit too complex to go over in zero seconds. So if you guys have questions about this in the future, you can take a look and uh, feel free to email me. But are there any questions? Because I think I am just about out of time. All right, be quick here. Uh, Dave yep. Swanson from Siena. At Nanog 54 in San Diego, uh, one of your colleagues, Lawrence, actually gave probably the best presentation I ever saw at Nanog. He was actually talking about power consumption in high-end routers. Yep. He made a lot of the same points you made with density basically being the one thing that sells boxes over everything else. Of course, DWDM systems exist because they're cheaper. Is it the contention here that you think that's gonna flip? Yes. Okay. And a lot of that comes from the complexity in 400 gig optics. And it's probably LJ, who LJ is of great speed. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So. So, okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Steve Ulrich, Arista Networks. Um, just kind of curious, uh, the density alignment with uh, optics and uh, router interfaces is great. I was just curious as to how you saw um, transport services, which are being delivered over the existing Rotom infrastructure, uh, kind of evolving and uh, you know, how service providers who uh, have to deliver both you know, packet service and uh, transport service uh, kind of sweating those assets or you know, how that yeah. transition is going to take place. Yeah, it, it's hard. Nobody can really build a greenfield network today. It's very hard. Um, and it's not that the solution I showed couldn't, you know, you could have transport. Obviously, you can transport those 400 gig wavelengths over as alien waves over an existing system. And we see that as kind of the migration path. Um, for things like 10 gig or even 100 gig services, we are looking at you know, bit transparent emulation for those services. Um, so we realize you know, we have to find a way to deal with those, those traditional transport services uh, long term. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're looking at, but not fully solved today. Go ahead. Brad Tarno, Rackspace. Um, maybe you can help me get past this block, but Merging these two, uh, these two networks is a problem with me because my routers need to be upgraded on a regular basis, they need to be rebooted on a regular basis, but my transport nodes are pretty much stable and they're up for a long time. So I see that big map and I see a router, it needs to be taken down for maintenance. Now I've lost 50, 25, 50% of my capacity for the entire metro region just to take a single router out of service. Is that just a mental thing I need to get past? Is there a, is there a counter to that? Well, I would say that, you know, I came from a service provider who was a, a very residential service provider, but by far the number one failure we had in our networks was fiber outages. Um, router outages were very infrequent. Obviously, maintenance is a whole nother, you know, planned maintenance, and that's absolutely true. If I have that much capacity through a device and transport elements, aren't upgraded nearly as often as router elements. Uh, but that wasn't the main failure mode that we saw pretty often. And obviously, Rackspace, you might be in more of a Metro DCI use case where that doesn't happen as often. But yeah, it's definitely a, definitely a concern on how you, you know, manage in that, that capacity in the future. Rudiger Falk, Deutsche Telekom. I somewhat tend to interpret this comment like, well, okay, you probably have to throw into the overall calculation the need for more spare capacity to deal with events like 
the question. Yeah, and it really comes down to how you've been handling protection in the past and how much capacity you have for whatever traffic's on your network. If you want 100% failover capacity at like layer three, then you may have already been doing that. Um, like I said, optical restoration is not wide, not really you know, widespread, in widespread use, but that was a method to maybe do it cheaper than layer three protection. Uh, but it's all part of the capacity planning and looking at your traffic flows. And if I've got lots of best effort traffic and someone loses their cat videos for a minute, maybe that's okay. Uh, but critical traffic, that's a whole different story. So, all right, well, I've exhausted my time. So thank you, everybody. All right. Sorry. <laughs>